Dance is a universe. And it's a community of people, and it's a celebration of life and into the afterlife. I've never been anywhere when I ask, may I dance, was I ever turned down. So dance is a universe. Hello everybody and welcome to A Conversation With. Today we're at Ballet Memphis in Midtown where we're talking with Maxine Strauder, who is known among many people in the dance world in Memphis as Silverbird. She is a dancer, she is an activist, she's a student of life, an extraordinary person, and I think you're really gonna enjoy our conversation today. My name is George Larimore, I'm glad to have you here on a conversation with Maxine. Thank you for being here, how you doing? Thank you, George, for considering a life worth sharing. Uh, I'm gonna ask you the toughest question of all, looking back on a life as a dancer, what does it feel like to be on the stage, in the footlights, when that audience is out there and that everything that you've prepared for is in that moment? What does that feel like to you? Home, perhaps. Home, yeah. It's a, a very comfortable place. Uh, there are many spirits alive in that space. Uh, and most of all, I've been with companies. Uh, when I started dancing, of course, I started dancing at home when I was two or three years old with my parents. But uh, dancing as a public expression uh, came in my teen years, my preteen and teen years. So dancing is a kind of home for me. I'm there. I belong there. And it's, it's a, a limitless world. Do you think people understand how much physical work, how much preparation is, preparation is involved to make something very difficult look fluid, look graceful? Do you think people understand how that is? They could not understand. No, they could not understand. And it, it, it's overcoming some of the difficulties is part of the challenge you have a, a uh, as a dancer, uh, you have your instrument, yourself, your whole self, your whole life experiences to that point in that moment, uh, engaging with the people. If you're fortunate to be in a company, as most of my life I have been in a company, uh, it's, it's a universe. Now, I want to, you were kind enough to, to give us some photographs of yourself from various points in your life. Uh, the one I like the most is little Maxine Starling uh, at your home with your grandparents. And it, you described the, the life that you grew up in as there was music everywhere. There was dance everywhere. Tell us how that sort of informed your life. Once one's experience and family, a musical family as ours is, um, is not unusual. Other people looking at it perhaps find it unusual, but uh, it was always music and very often dance and different kinds of dancing and dancing to express um, something good out of the oven. My grandmother was a great cook, and um, her, her saying to me as she greeted me in the morning was, now pet, what will you have? Biscuits, rolls, or cornbread, because she had a warming closet. So uh, as a dancer, it's very normal, natural, to draw on these ex life experiences. And, and then you offer that, to, if you have an audience, sometimes you're dancing just for the heck of dancing, you know, but other times you joy. are performing. You know. For the joy of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, again, you grew up in West Virginia, but when you, when you were a young girl, uh, because of your father's work, you moved to Cleveland. And I, you told me that it was not the Cleveland we know today. This was very segregated 
Cleveland. Uh, so uh, it, there were different difficulties in your life as an African-American as, as there were all over this country. But you had an experience when you were 10, you saw the musical Carmen Jones. Tell us, if you would, how that felt watching it and how, what, it, what it turned inside of you. Carmen Jones, as I describe it now, means a universe of creative, mostly African-Americans, connected with my family, connected with the National Organization of Negro Musicians, brought Carmen Jones to Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, my cousin, Kathleen Holland Forbes, was one of the organizers. And so the, the people who were in the company, the musical people in the company, were in and out of her home. Uh, on 84th Street. The dancing, I see it because we were seated behind a, a, a concert based violin. And so I saw the stage and I saw the dancers and I, I hear the singers. And I told my mother, whom I address as Nana, I told Nana I wanted to do that. And so she took me to a neighborhood community center called Karamu. And some of the dancers on that stage were from Karamu. And so that was the connection of Miss Dunham's artistry and uh, the local dancers on tour with Catherine Dunham in uh, Carmen Jones. For those of us who don't know Catherine Dunham's work and influence, tell us a little bit about her and about what she meant to you, please. Well, Catherine Dunham was a sensation and a success in uh, the dance world. And she's also an anthropologist uh, from the University of Chicago with Boas. And her research that interested me was the Haitian research. And so, uh, Seeing the dancers in Carmen Jones, reading about Miss Dunham as a, as a young person, and knowing the import she had in the dance world in film, traveling uh, mostly Europe. I, I don't remember that she went to Asia, at least in my, my time, uh, knowing her. Uh, but I did not meet Miss Dunham right away. I met. Uh, people who were associated with her company. In 1952, uh, Caramu House took uh, some of the dance uh, company to New York City. And Miss Dunham was not there. Miss Dunham was on tour. I have no idea where she was. But one of our dancers, Nikki, was sailing through the dance studio when we walked in the door. Um, and that was exciting. Walter Nix, his name was Walter Nix. He's from Cleveland, but the, the Caramu Theater was in Cleveland. And um, so there was always a connection. To, dance for me uh, has meant community, connection, uh, enthusiasm, uh, an encyclopedia of experiences. It, it, dance is a world. And so Miss Dunham, is one of the peak experiences of that world. Now, I want to remind people that, in case they didn't get it, you were, as you told me the other day, you were, you were a kind of a child in a grown-up world in this company, in this dance company. Uh, this is a, a community, the Caramu uh, Dance uh, Organization, goes back to the 20s. And I enter as a high school student in about 16. So everyone in the company was uh, in their 20s or older. And uh, b because Caramu came about uh, in the 20s and in, a, in a, a neighborhood that was immigrant, not African American. When it moved up to the 80s on 89th Street, then it was centered in the African American community. And we drew from people 
all over the town. And in my high school, as a guide, one of the things I did at Caramel Besides Dance was a tour guide. One year, I toured people from 52 different countries. And you went with Caramel to Haiti. Yes, that's very important to me. Even before I met Miss Dunham, I was at the, one of the sites where she is most uh, known for her research and some of the dance that she uh, performed and taught is based in Haiti and in Haitian ritual. And I think I must have been about 18, uh, about 18, when uh, Karamu House had a sociological uh, United Nations connected uh, two-week tour of Haiti uh, and the famous citadel, uh, which we climbed that, that mountain on back of donkeys, straight up. Yes, so uh, then I was able to read about Miss Dunham's uh, research and the importance of the various rituals and the symbolism and visit a temple, a religious space, an outside space, space called a hugan, and to uh, meet the priests and priestesses there uh, and have a background so that when I eventually met Miss Dunham in the 70s, I was very familiar with uh, her work, her persona, she radiated, Miss Dunham radiated. I would say that you radiate too. So. <laughs> Let's talk a, just a, a little about your education. You went to Fisk University in Nashville, then you went overseas to Scandinavia where you studied languages. I believe you told me you speak German and you speak Danish today. And uh, the hitchhiking through Germany is a, is a story I'd like to tell if we had more time to tell it. Uh, but anyway, after that, you, after spending time in Scandinavia, you went back to Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, where you got your degree. Now, what was your degree in? I have a undergraduate scholar's degree. Uh, it's a Bachelor of Undergraduate Scholars. It's not a BA. It's, it, it was something that was created in the early uh, 60s. Um, I had gone to Fisk, and I want to say that Fisk is the school of my grandfather and to Ot Nine, my mother in the uh, class of uh, 35. She did not finish, she finished in West Virginia. So I'm third generation Fisk University. And uh, I remember as a child there in Beckley, I sat, I sat on a trunk and I looked down, I was five years old or about, and there was the emblem on Nana's trunk of the Fisk Jubilee Singers, and that is one of the most important symbols in my life, because later on, as a student at Fisk, uh, I experienced the, the Jubilee Singers. It would be natural to ask you how you happened to be in Memphis. And I know that you went to the University of Indiana, got your degree in library science, right. and you came here to work. What did you find when you came to Memphis? What was it in terms of dance and people involved in dance? Uh, one of the first things I heard, thank you, George. One of the first things I heard about was this dance company uh, that was uh, in Midtown connected with uh, the theater. Uh, and it was a choreographer from Virginia who was brought here by a poet, Margaret Dana. Uh, and uh, so this young man was uh, teaching dance. I think he must have started in Le Moyne area, but he was uh, at uh, Playhouse area when I was able to come. We are in Memphis because Dawn Rebecca Strauder had been traipsed all over to schools where she was in a, an ethnic minority. She's tired of being in school with white folks. This is plain and simple. Now this and, is your daughter we're talking yeah, about. Dawn yeah, Dawn Rebecca. So I promised her that when we graduated with the library degree from Indiana University, that she could choose where we lived. So we got a Greyhound bus and we went to my interviews from um, 
North Carolina, several places of the North Carolina, North Carolina and in Tennessee. And when she got to Tennessee, when she got to Memphis, not being uh, upset as adults were about the events of the Memphis in 1974, uh, she saw lots of black folk. And she said, I want to, I want to, this is the, this is the place. And I had made her the promise. I said, when we graduate with the library, Master of Library Science, you choose the place we live. And so that's our good fortune to have been here, as she said the other day, almost 50 years. Now, how did you meet Harry Bryce? Um, I was a librarian for Shelby State Community College, and my co-worker, who was a Memphian, a poet, knew Harry Bryce, and she told me early on that there was this dance group uh, directed by Harry Bryce. And so it took me the first year, 74, to get acclimated to work as a librarian um, to come in the summer of 75 to meet uh, Bryce and Mark uh, and uh, the Playhouse people. And we were in, housed in the Playhouse uh, annex. It's not the proper word, but in the house is no longer there on Tucker. And uh, that's where we rehearsed and we did with my good friend, still all these years with Paulette Reagan, Tubular Bells. Yeah. And we, we, it was filmed by the University of Memphis, which was Memphis State in those days. Yeah. We performed that in Playhouse th Theater, Playhouse Theater, and uh, filmed it at Memphis State and uh, had a wonderful tour of that. And then Bryce decided to do this African wedding, and he brought Miss Danner, the poet, from uh, Chicago. That was his mentor. And we did the performance at the Playhouse. I forget how many performances of the African, uh, the African wedding that we did. And Miss Danner insisted that we have a feast afterwards, and we had goat right Don there in the lobby of the theater. Dawn must have loved this. Well, Dawn had her own theater life with Mark uh, Martinez uh, and also somewhat Harry and Vincent. Yeah. Uh, she was uh, running sound for a production. Yeah. Uh, slides, I'm not sound, slides. But it, but it did production. work. It, she it had her, her own yeah. life yeah. in the theater and her own connections. And, and so yeah. uh, that was wonderful for her. Now, tell me about Project Motion, your work with Project Motion. I know they, they observed or celebrated your 75th birthday with a performance. Project Motion was a collective of performers and artists, and uh, they existed, but I was not aware of them while I was active with, with Bryson as an independent performer. Uh, but once I found them, that was my that dance base and my dance home. Uh, and eventually, when I was no longer performing, I was on their board for a number of years. So the innovative, young, uh, mostly young college. I was introduced to Project Motion through uh, a Holly Lau, my professor, who was then later my uh, lead professor on my thesis for the University of Memphis, my second master's. And talking about um, 75 rotations, the uh, observance of your 75th birthday, you produced this program for Project Motion and performed as well, right? Not quite. I was in a rehearsal and Rosie walked by the door and leaned in the door and said, we need to dance your life. And she just went on. And the next thing I know, people were talking about, well, we need to pull this thing together. And as you have so clearly noticed, they decided to start with when I first came to the dance studio. And, and that was the, the kind of mythology. We thought that Jose Limon was coming from New York. It ended up being Charles Weidman. These are all foundation of modern dance people, uh, which uh, served for the 
Project Motion as their part of their basis because they were doing Humphrey Weidman and Lamone Technique. And these were people that I had met as, as, a, as a teenager. Yeah. So uh, it connects the teenage Maxine with the 80-year-old Maxine. And they were very generous to, uh, let, to perform the things that I told them uh, right on down to the, the present day with Project Motion itself and the fact that we, they invited me to perform here in Memphis with them. Now, to rewind just a little bit and to, to, to use an expression that you spoken when you and I were talking, you, you talk about how dance connects. Uh, there are photographs of you uh, in the commercial appeal uh, in which they refer to you as an apostle of dance. There is a, a piece about you in the religion section of the commercial appeal because you'd been taking, you'd been going out and performing at churches or in getting people in churches in Memphis involved through dance. Tell me how that worked and how that felt for you. After the dance, after the Bryce Company uh, ceased to perform as a unit, uh, I went back to something that I had learned at Kaoru, which was liturgical dance, which is uh, ritual and religion and dance, which of course led me to the Dr. Brewster experience and the Smithsonian, the choreography for that. But to address Project Motion, these were young people, nifty college age kids uh, in all aspects of production of dance. And they welcomed me. So I got to perform with Holly Lau and uh, Wayne Marshall Smith uh, and in, in, in workshops and in classes. That became my dance performing home in Memphis. I, 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 don't want to, I don't want to use this term, but I know someone's bound to have used it with you. You don't act your age. You, you're still involved in classes at the university. You're learning Spanish, I believe you told me the other day. You're teaching Tai Chi classes. Uh, tell me about age. Tell me what you think about it. Well, you know, again, you go back to Granny Beck. Uh, my mother's mother was born in 1867 in Ontario. And she held me on her lap, and she held Dawn Rebecca, my daughter, on her lap the year before she died in 64. So she lived to be 97. My mother, who came to, with us to Memphis, uh, lived to be 96. So longevity on that side of our family is normal. It's age. Yeah, the bones ache, the muscles are not what they used to be, but I'm fortunate to have relatively good health. And being a dancer is invigorating. And when I'm not performing, I was fortunate to be guided to Tai Chi. So I'm a part of the uh, Tai Chi for Health world community. Um, and that is a, a nurturing community of people and concepts. So age, yes, I suppose we look forward in this year to my 84th birthday. Don't you celebrate one in April too? Uh, I have a birthday in April, April. yes. You're, you're 16. I'm, yeah. The funny thing about uh, the, the, the April 30th birthday is it, it ties into our experience with opera. Uh, I was born on Walpurgisnacht. That's a Wagnerian uh, phenomena, and uh, opera has been a big part of our lives because my father's youngest brother was 20 years with the Metropolitan Opera in New York City. So it's 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 creativity. It's people say the arts. I say it's creativity, and the creative people that we found in Memphis are the storytellers and. Uh, we, it just enriches life. So yes, it's creaky, and you have to pay more attention to stairs. And of course, I've worn glasses since I was two and a half. And the loss of the hearing when I was in, in library school, that's all age, but... but That's all life, isn't it? It's all life, and it's all people, 
and generosity and love. And when we have to deal with tragedies, there's always something that envelops us. And there's always community that envelops us. We have a couple of minutes left, and I, I want to go back to Catherine Dunham. And, and, and I see the way you, your affect when you talk about her. Here, all these many, many years, these decades later since you first knew who she was and knew what she was, who was doing, um, she had an impact on you. I would like to ask you about the impact that you have had on others. What do people tell you? What do people who you knew a long time ago or knew 10 years ago say to you? Still meet some of my kids from the library world that call me library, not librarian. Uh, the children of people that have been generous to include me in their lives. Uh, those cycle of gifts a cycle of gifts of self to others is, is very important. And it, of course, that feeds the creative process. And so creativity is, is not limited to stage or bars. Uh, the narrative, the kindness that you have uh, shown our family and bringing out the historical connection uh, uh, and, the, and the many communities that we live in. So I thank you for that. Oh, I thank you for that. Maxine, it's, uh, it's always such a great pleasure to talk with you under any circumstances. Uh, thank you again to, uh, to uh, Ballet Memphis for allowing us into this lovely facility to do this interview today. And thank you for watching. I hope you would join us again on A Conversation With. I'm George Larimore.